some overhead presentation to give, which should even add to the interest. So Don, um, we'll invite you to the front to talk about the one megawatt steam-powered radio station. Okay. And uh, I certainly uh, hope you'll enjoy today's presentation. It's... Why am I up here talking about something that started in 1910? Well, a long, long time ago, I was in rugby, England, it was summer holidays from studying engineering, and I worked for two years at the rugby radio station. And although uh, I've been gone for a long time, I found a lot of the information actually on the web, so I can't tell you I remembered it all, but I remembered a fair bit of it. This is what it looked like when I was there, and probably looked that way in about 1923. <coughs> And we really have to start our story in 1910. And Marconi had just started making his radios. And I don't know if most of you realize that radios in those days had no tubes at all. There was a spark transmitter, which was basically just a generator making a bike spark and a crystal set receiving it with a tuned circuit on both antennas, but no tubes. Marconi had had already a bit of friction with Britain because they hadn't terribly supported him in 1901 when he made his first and second and third uh, messages across the Atlantic Ocean. And in fact, many people in Britain said he was fibbing when he heard SSS coming through in Newfoundland on Signal Hill. They said, oh, that's just noise from the thermonic noise from the air, the atmosphere. And he picked a poor choice because da 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 is S does kind of just sound like something spluttering, in fact, pretty much like a lot of lightning hits. So, by 1904, he finally actually sent a message from Roosevelt to the King of England, and there was no debate because he let somebody else hear it coming in, but still, no tubes. Again, the fellow that we really have to thank for radio completely, and I think most of you know this, DeForest changed the Englishman's diode into a triode, and we suddenly had amplification. But still, Marconi was slow to use these because they were only good for, at those times, audio. They didn't even use them in radio. So, Marconi started his company in the States. Although he was an Italian with an English mother, he wasn't amused with Britain's support of his marvelous new thing called a radio. So off he goes to America, starts a company, and then offers the British Colonial Office to set up 18 of these great big radio stations around the world. And this would be in all the colonies of Britain, which would be England, Egypt, and India, or Hong Kong, and so on, all the way around the world. And Britain being a bit slow, disgusted and disgusted in Parliament, and in fact said, no, we don't want Marconi doing this because he's, an, he's not an Englishman, we want to control this ourselves. So they turned him down to start with, and in fact disgusted in Parliament for many years. Until 1913, they were still undecided, but they allowed him to have a contract to build these 18. But things didn't go quite the way not either company wanted. Because of the impending war with Germany, they canceled the contract. Believe it or not, Marconi had his complete systems built in Britain and in Egypt, and none of the rest of them built, and they just stopped it in 1913, and did nothing through the entire First World War. So, we move on to 1923. And basically they stole all the ideas from Marconi, and by this time, Mr. Shockley had invented 
both the uh, Pentode and, in fact, before him in about 1910, De Forest in Chicago had invented the triode, added an electrode, and Mr. Shockley, working for Siemens in Germany, had invented the Pentode. So now the British added some tubes or valves to the system and they figured they could make a better radio than Mr. Marconi. And in fact, right, because Marconi did not embrace new technology. He liked his spark coil and his crystal set, basically, and didn't use tubes for some time. So we look at this, and the post office, finally in 1923, bought some land. And in fact, interestingly, the home office gave it to the Navy. More intrigue. <coughs> The Navy had it. Why? Well, because this radio was going to talk to ships. It, it's not that obscure a reason. And the post office to start with was going to be the people who know all about radio. Well, they didn't really know much, but they cheated because they looked at Marconi's set and basically stole all the ideas of the antenna and all the radio part of it. Now, where is rugby? Well, <laughs> right in the middle. Now, of course, you can't be more than, I think it's 42 miles from the ocean in England anywhere, but there it is, right in the middle where the arrow is, and surrounded by rather flat land, and some of the good conditions, they picked a good spot, A, it was flat, it was high up for England, 300 feet, that, that's high for England, <laughs> A, they have mountains that are like 1,500 feet, and there was no dip, so basically they had a big lump of land in the middle. And the antenna, which we'll learn really was the entire of England, the ground plane for it, and the earth had to be high conductivity. Wouldn't do to have it in mountainous areas like Wales because the ground is not conductive, but it was very conductive. So they built their first station, and it was a tremendous success. Its call signs were opened. By the way, it took them from 23 to 26, three years to build this thing. GBR, Great Britain Radio, and it was Morse code, very slow Morse code in fact, ten, under 10 words a minute, and you could hear it around the world with a crystal set. Now having said that, most people didn't because it only had stuff on it for ships. <laughs> it wasn't didn't have any interesting stuff for normal people. But it was a tremendous success. Ships around the world could use it. In fact, every country was invited, if they called in from their spark transmitter on their boat, they would relay the message to the country that was involved. So they had every country, and they all in those days did use Morse code. Where do we get the steam part of it? Well, Marconi, because there wasn't energy everywhere you put a, a station, put in every station that they made a, an old uh, transmitter, those original 18, they planned a great big steam engine turning, a great big generator. And this is where we get the steam. The government copied, and they claimed they copied 16 of his patents, which then, interestingly, other people believed that Marconi stole those patents, so there's still debates in the courts over who invented radio, and really it was mostly done by committee. But there was a large steam engine, two megawatt, in fact, steam engine, a little bit inefficient here. Two megawatts getting down to a megawatt out on the antenna, a whole megawatt of heating along the way, loss. It turned at 300 RPM, an enormous generator, picture, well, 35 feet in diameter, about this wide, a great big wheel turning 300 times a minute, not a second. And it produced an amazing DC voltage of 160,000 volts. That was a plate current, 1,000 volts. <laughs> now, this was a direct copy, no changes, from Marconi's, because his spark generator produced 160,000 volts DC for its spark. And in fact, they, they never even thought about AC, because it was so early they weren't using typically AC stuff. And 3-volt filaments, we'll get a little more to that. And believe it or not, it was one of the first valve or tube radios in the world because most of them one were still working quite nicely with spark. And we actually had 1.5 milliwatt, uh, megawatts of DC power coming out, so we already lost about 25% just in heat from the generator. That's what it looked like in 1924 when they got on the air. 
The whole building was brick and spruce. In fact, spruce imported from BC, Sitka spruce. No metal in the building. The towers all around are carrying the actual wires out to the big antenna. But uh, that's what it looked like, and I worked there in the mid-50s. The whole building there was for that radio. Let's look at a little bit of detail about it. To start with, we'll go right through the radio. How did they get an actual frequency? This was technology never done before. They took a steel tuning fork <laughs> that vibrated at 1700 and 17.7777 times a second. And that's what they used, a tuning fork. And they physically, like an uh, Aclatron watch, a little tuning fork vibrating and a magnet beside it, vibrated it in a feedback circuit, and off it went at 1,700 cycles. You could hear it, you know. So, that fed into an amplifier which picked the third harmonic. And if you know about tubes, they were running C-class, which means only half the cycle with distortion, and they could pick up the harmonic, the third harmonic, and the third harmonic, and the third harmonic, three third harmonics are the ninth harmonic, and you get this super high frequency of 16 kilohertz, which some of you could still hear. <laughs> I couldn't. So, they had not a bad exciter. We talk about typically, you know, 20, 20 watts, 10 watts, 5 watt exciter, but this one was 50 kilowatts with tubes, 50 kilowatts of power from the exciter at 16 kilohertz. Not too bright a picture, but these, this is what the amplifiers look like. They built a linear amp that was driven by the exciter. Five bays of 10, 20 tubes on this side, 20 tubes on that side, or sorry, 10 on this side, 10 on that side. Each one, 10 kilowatts, 20 watt, 200 kilowatts, five bays, making a mega. To give you an idea, this, that's got 160,000 volts on there and there's those white things are the porcelain insulators holding up the wires. So there we are, there's the math of it. 20 10 kilowatt tubes is 200 watts of water cooled tetros. They've just been invented. Well the first time they were used at this size, <coughs> invented by Mr. Shockley of Germany after the war. So and five bays of them could be connected together to give a million watts. <coughs> Here's a block diagram of just basically how it worked and what I'm talking about. A tuning fork with some feedback. Yeah. Three stages of driver feeding a one megawatt linear amp. Yeah, we'll get over here. Into an antenna and actually it's three coils because there was some feedback actually from the antenna. <laughs> and you'll see a 3.75 mile long antenna. <laughs> So we'll look at those. Each of the tubes, the tetrodes, were demountable. Fancy name for you could take them apart. They were like the thousand year old axe. It's had 10 heads and 12 handles, but it's the same axe. Well, you could take the tube apart whenever something went and actually take the filament out. Didn't have a cathode. First grid, second grid, and plate. And believe it or not, we used to take them apart non-stop because we could take any one of those out of service and run on the rest and we filled them back up to make them work with plasticine and tar. <laughs> 1910 or so technology. Plasticine tar. Yeah, tar for the permanent joints and plasticine for the ones we opened. So they were continually evacuated because they did leak and they had suction on them and they used an oil condensation pump. What it said was they boiled oil and then cooled it with cold water. What happened? It condensed and made a vacuum. And in fact, a pretty good vacuum. In fact, a vacuum that would run very nicely in places that need a vacuum today. And feeding it were two oil immersion rotary pumps out to atmosphere. So three stages of vacuum, and they could achieve an extremely good vacuum of 10 to the minus 6 millimeters of mercury, which is pretty well a, as good a vacuum as you can get today and they were making that in 1923 and when I was there a few years later 
Is yes. that the same Stalkley that invented the two transistor? Pardon? Is he the man who invented okay. the transistor? Mr. Shockley didn't invent the transistor, but his name was given in honor of it. Three people at Bell Labs invented it in 48, but he got his name on something like Mr. Watt and Mr. Ampere and so on. Interestingly, DeForest, and you can help me out here, invented the triode, which really got the whole thing going. Is any unit ever called the DeForest? I don't think so. And yet he was far more important in many ways than everyone else because he took the Englishman's diode, which rectified, in other words, a filament and a plate in a vacuum, and put another element in, and he actually got amplification. Amplification didn't work. They made the, pent or the tetrode because it removed the interelectrode capacity. And then a Dutchman, who get everybody into this, invented the pentode and put in the other grid, the deaccelerating grid. So there we are. And these tubes were water cooled, steel tubes, not glass, water cooled with a water jacket over them. And in fact, they produced, you'll see, almost 10 kilowatts. And there was each tube <laughs> heated almost 10 kilowatts because we have uh, about 40% inefficiency in the tube. Think of the filament, 18 gauge wire heated up, all red hot, 18 gauge, at 3 volts, and I think it was something like 60 amps to heat it up to this. And these tubes were specifically designed by Britain to run this, and they were, as I say, roughly the first time that ever big tubes had been used. Yeah, let's try that again. Okay. There we go. So by 1926, they were still fiddling with this thing, making constant improvements. And they found out that it was 65% efficient. Well, that's not too bad for power in to power out. 45% though of, if they get a megawatt out, how much is 45%? Well, it's about 400 and, well, four, 450 kilowatts but heated in the building, wasted. <laughs> uh, they could keep the building and a large cooling pond very warm. But it worked. And in fact, when I was there, and this is still true, anywhere you picked up a four-foot fluorescent, held it by one end, it would key in time with the transmitter for, oh, 20 miles around. You could get a fluorescent to light up. By the way, nobody used fluorescents because if they had them in their home, they would blink at the keyed rate of the transmitter. So fluorescents were not popular other than an amusement. The output transformer, I don't know if you can really see it there, but enormous. They tell me that, think of the wires, three inches across. These are some of the insulators holding it up. An enormous transformer. Call that a spider web, all built out of spruce. Give you some facts about it. It was hexagonal, pegged all together. No nails, no glue, because it was hot all the time. Because even in Britain, you can't get dry wood. So the wood, even though it was dried and varnished, was still running hot just from the IR leak in the wood. In fact, we'll get a bit more to that. But you could, they tell me if you drove a train down in the middle of it, it was big enough to get a train into, it would like melt instantly if you put a slug in this transformer. It was an air transformer. There were only six uh, turns. They were six inches apart, sorry, five turns. Get it right yet. Yeah. Five spiders, five layers of eight turns each. The spiders had four turns in the primary, and the coupling transformer one back. So we'll just go back to that if we can. And you can see there's five layers long. That was the transformer. We tuned it with a great big <laughs> wooden pole with a V on the end of it and pushed because we didn't want to get any near it because. The corona off of it, you get an arc, something like this, so you, you didn't get near it. <coughs> to monitor the current and to look at the plate dip, as we call it, if you're trans checking a transmitter and it still worked, that was one of the current transformers on it. The hole in the middle, about that big around, because that's how big the leech wire was coming off the antenna about three and a half inches to carry, you'll see, 2100 amps peak to peak. And these were on 
This is interesting. The Lich wire went down here in, on copper pipe. The copper pipe was carrying continuously 700 amps. That pipe isn't a water pipe. It's the, the final output from the amplifiers and then terminated 6,000 36 gauge copper wires all varnished and silk insulated going up through those current transformers and that was the output from the uh, coil and this side is interesting. This is the balanced balm going out to the antenna of two litch wires. And that thing's about, just to give you a scale, like four feet, three feet high. <laughs> They're big. Insulators. So 651, believe me, I didn't memorize this, I found out. A 36 gauge wire in the litch wire, about that big around. Now, for those of you who know, you still lose litch wire wear in the tiny little coil for your MF in your little six transistor radio. That coil is typically made of two or three wires, very fine, all put together. And why is it? Well, radio waves want to go on the skin effect on the outside of the wire, and they'd already learned this by this time, didn't want to stay inside, so they have gave it a large surface area for the same amount of wire. It was about that diameter, and again, flexible to move because copper pipe or something to take 700 amps, it's not a very flexible wire. You had to have a tank circuit finally at the end. The capacitors filled the entire second floor of the building, and they were great big tanks with mica between steel sheets, and it was bigger than this room, the capacitors all the way down there, and again, if you do your calculation of the coil and the capacitor, you realize at 16 kilohertz it's a very big capacitor, lots of capacitance, and it had to stand roughly a megawatt, a uh, megavolt, get that right, because of the peak-to-peak -peak voltages on it. So those were the capacitors, not a very clear picture, but you can see about a foot of standoff insulator on each set of plates. Oil filled, mica between them and oil. So the oil was to keep them apart and the mica as well.